Hi everyone, and welcome to Remaking Tomorrow, a series of conversations about the future of teaching and learning. I'm Ryan Radzeski, here with Greg Baer, and we're the co-authors of When You Wonder, You're Learning, Mr. Rogers' Enduring Lessons for Raising Creative, Curious, Caring Kids. This is a podcast powered by Remake Learning, a network that ignites engaging, relevant, and equitable learning in support of young people navigating rapid social and technological change. On today's episode, we're talking with Mark Brackett, the founding director of the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence and a professor in the Child Study Center at Yale University. For more than 20 years, Mark has researched the role of emotions and emotional intelligence in learning, creativity, relationships, and more. He's published more than 150 articles and his best-selling book, Permission to Feel has been translated into 22 languages. Mark Brackett, welcome to Remaking Tomorrow. Well, thank you for having me. Mark, you're a renowned researcher, writer, speaker. You're on TV. You've developed all sorts of successful programs and apps, and your name is almost synonymous with emotional intelligence. And again and again, you've credited one person with starting you down this path, your Uncle Marvin. So can you tell us about Uncle Marvin and what made him so special? How much time do you have? (laughs) (laughs) So Uncle Marvin was a teacher. He was a middle school teacher in the Catskill Mountains of New York State. And he taught social studies and then became, uh, back then it was called a learning disabilities teacher consultant, a counselor. Long story short is that, you know, I had a pretty tough childhood. I had two parents who loved me a lot, but I would say neither one of them went to the school of emotional intelligence. And, you know, it wasn't easy to deal with my parents, nor did they really know how to deal with me. And so Uncle Marvin happened to come in my life when I was around 11 years old and suffering a lot. As you know, from the title of my book, Permission to Feel, I'm convinced that my uncle was the only adult in my life who gave me that permission to feel. Your work with your uncle eventually formed the beginnings of Ruler, which is an approach to social emotional learning that's since reached more than 4 million students. Mark, first of all, can you tell us what RULER is? It's an acronym. What does it stand for? So let me just go back a little bit about Uncle Marvin. So, sure. you know, when I was 13 years old or 12 years old, Uncle Marvin happened to stay with us because he was getting his master's degree. And he was writing lessons back then in the 1970s and 80s around how to teach kids about feelings. He literally rewrote the entire social studies curriculum to be about emotions. And so that all the characters in every chapter, he would say, what did this character feel? And why do you think they felt that way? And how does that relate to you? And it was remarkable what he was doing. By the way, he got a lot of pushback even then. But for me, it was pretty interesting because we'd have these really rich conversations when I was a teenager about the word alienation and the word connected and the word despair and elation. I'd learn all these feeling words. Fast forward 10 years, I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do with my life, decide to get my PhD in psychology studying something around feelings. And there's books out on emotional intelligence. I happened to find these two people, Peter Salovey and Jack Mayer, who were the founders of the theory, wrote to both of them and had lunch with both of them, got rejected at Yale, where I'm now a professor, (laughs) (laughs) and uh, went for my PhD with Jack Mayer at the University of New Hampshire. And it was interesting because Uncle Marvin was not a, a scientist. He was a practitioner. But yet every one of his ideas was starting to be tested scientifically by researchers like Peter and Jack. And so now the question is, so how do you operationalize this concept of emotional intelligence? Well, over the years, I've created this acronym, which I call RULER, which is recognizing emotions in oneself and other, understanding where those feelings come from and their consequences, labeling those feelings with precise words, knowing how and when to express emotions across context and culture. And then the big one, which is, How do you deal with those feelings, emotion regulation? And Mark, you've said that among these, that L, labeling, is the one we have the most trouble with. Why is that? As a matter of fact, I've come to the conclusion that we have trouble with all of them. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Labeling is like the pathway to begin to build that self-awareness. And I just find it fascinating that most people just don't really know how they're feeling. And You know, we we go around saying fine, good, okay, meh, uh, you're not even using words. And then when you push people, well, what are you really feeling? They're like, I'm not sure. Or they say happy. Even when I test people on their emotion knowledge, you know, give them, for example, I'll ask you guys, you know, what's the psychological difference between anxiety, stress, and pressure, and fear? I won't push you to do that right now. (laughs) But 
I've done this with CEOs of big companies. I've done this with leaders of schools. I was just in a school district last week with about 500 educators. No one got it right. And so it just goes to show us that people have not been taught words to describe their feelings. And you and your colleagues, Mark, have come up with some pretty amazing ways to help folks with that labeling and with the other letters as well. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about the How We Feel app? What is that and what does it do? I had a great thing happen to me. The pandemic was really tough for all of us, but one great thing that came out of the pandemic was a relationship with a co-founder and CEO of Pinterest, whose name is Ben Silberman. So Ben had read my book and we got introduced and he and I started talking and basically decided together to take all of his resources and technology, you know, at Pinterest and creativity and all of my resources in terms of emotional intelligence in my book and science and just put it together and build this pretty cool app that we call How We Feel. And so How We Feel is basically a tool to help people build emotional self-awareness. It's over 244 words built into it with the definitions, helps people to track their emotions over time, help people to understand, you know, why they're having their feelings. And we programmed it with about 36 research-based strategies to help people regulate their emotions. So to teach people research-backed strategies to manage. And uh, we've had a lot of success. We've had hundreds of thousands of people download it and use it. And uh, we're just extraordinarily excited about it. And it's free, 100% free forever. It's spectacular. And I can imagine how an individual interacts with that. And we're curious how a community interacts with the ruler acronym and the work that you do. You mentioned a moment ago that you were in a school district. So we imagine that you're with teachers, maybe with families of the kids in that school district. So how does ruler work in practice? So ruler is, it's a work in progress. We now have 5,000 schools across the world using ruler, which is remarkable because it started in one classroom in upstate New York. And my uncle's no longer with me, but I know that he's beaming, you know, with joy, because what he started has now really taken off. I think it's important to put this in context. So Ruler started as a classroom program where a sixth grade teacher was teaching kids about feelings. And I was a kid who was struggling and my uncle taught me these words and we had a great relationship and it helped me out a lot. And so when I got older and I was deciding what to do with my life, I said, let's take everything you did Uncle Marvin in the classroom and let me marry it with the research that I know that I'm learning about in emotional intelligence and we'll pull it together, and we're going to get it out to the world. And we did do that, except we failed horrifically. <laughs> we failed because we were expecting people to just implement this with quality and fidelity. And what we found was that adults who were raising and teaching children just didn't have an emotion education. And it wasn't that they were bad people. They're great people. They're caring people. They just didn't have background in emotions. They didn't understand them. They didn't have the language. They didn't know the research-based strategies. So we had to go back to the drawing board and really work on the training and curricula for the adults. And so it started with teachers and educators and counselors. Then we realized we got to get the principals on the bus. And then we really got to get the superintendent on the bus. And then eventually we realized families needed to be involved. And so Ruler Today is what we call a systemic approach to social and emotional learning, whereby we infuse the mindsets and principles, the skills and tools of emotional intelligence into what I like to call the immune system of a district. So leaders, teachers, students, and families, everybody who works in the system gets to be educated in these concepts. And we have pretty good research to show that it makes a difference. This is Ryan Radzeski here with Greg Baer. We're talking with Mark Brackett, the founding director of the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence and the author of Permission to Feel, Unlock the Power of Emotions to Help Yourself and Your Children Thrive. Mark, you've said that there are no bad emotions, that rather all emotions are information. And that is a philosophy that echoes someone who's very important to Greg and I, and that's Fred Rogers. He too made space for all of the big emotions that kids and their families had. And I'm curious, what does it mean to think about emotions as information rather than as things that are good or bad in and of themselves? How can reframing them in that way be helpful? You know, it's really interesting you ask that question because I know that you work with a lot of educators and parents. And so I'm going to share a little story about this. Just a couple weeks ago, I'm on the phone with a principal of a school who had trained students in the school to be ruler ambassadors, meaning they were the co-teachers of this work, which is really kind of cool. And at the end of the year, she interviewed them to ask them, like, what was their biggest takeaway? 
And she thought it was going to be one of our tools, like the meta moment, which is our tool to help people manage their feelings or something like that. And they said, no, our biggest takeaway was there's no such thing as a bad emotion. And she said, well, tell me more. The kid said, well, we're always like on our mood meter. If we're in the red, we're anxious, or angry. We're always told like, get out of that red. That was what we were told previously. But now we're taught that emotions are information, that my anxiety is there for a reason, that I'm perceiving uncertainty. My anger is there for a reason. There's an actual injustice. And I was just blown away. These are elementary school students, by the way. Just the way they have kind of internalized these concepts. And I think for me, what's most important about that is that emotions are data. They're signals, right? They come unbidden. We're not, we don't ask for our feelings to come to us. You know, you're walking on the streets and someone says something to you, or you go to your office and you see something you don't want to see or whatever it happens, you know, all of a sudden you're like, whoa, I didn't even know I had feelings. A lot of men, for example, they were like, you know, Mark, I didn't know I had feelings until the pandemic. I'm like, well, sometimes you, know, you got to get sand in your face. But the point is, we can use all of our emotions wisely. Anxiety is not a bad thing. It's saying there's uncertainty. So let's figure out how to manage our perceptions of that uncertainty. Anger is, some people call it a destructive emotion. I really don't like that. You know, when we feel angry, it's because we're perceiving injustice. That means people are treating us unfairly. So that's something to really talk about with people, a partner, a parent, a kid. It's something to problem solve about, not something to deny, ignore, suppress. It's hard, Ryan, not to be thinking about Mr. Rogers as we're hearing Mark speak, right? And I'm, I'm thinking about Mr. Rogers. What do you do with the mad that you feel when you feel so mad you could bite, when the whole wide world seems oh so wrong and nothing you do seems very right? And, it, you know, it goes on from there. It's just this is so profoundly important what you're describing, Mark. And we've mentioned a few times this best-selling book that you've written entitled Permission to Feel. Can you give our listeners an idea more about that book and the sort of strategies that you provide for leveraging the powers of human emotion? You know, you asked me about emotional intelligence earlier, and I gave you the definition of, of these five skills. But one thing that I've learned in my career is that unless we shift people's mindsets about the value and importance of emotions, nobody's going to want to learn these skills. And I had this idea as I was writing my book because I give a lot of presentations to companies and school districts around the world. And I was giving this one speech and there was a stereotypical, you know, tough guy in the audience at one of my talks. And he was not having my presentation. And at lunch, I went up to him and I said, you know, hey, how's it going? He looks at me and he's like, you know, the lunch looks pretty good. And um, I decided to make him my pride. I'm like, I'm gonna get this guy to buy into it. The principles <laughs> of emotional intelligence. And so at the end of the training, I looked at him and I said, hey, you, you know, what do you think now? And this guy, six foot something, stands up, looks around the room of 100 people, starts crying in front of everyone. And he goes, Mark, all I have to say is thank you for giving me permission to feel. And of course, I'm crying. Everybody's crying. It was like one of those moments. But it was a real moment for this person because, you know, I learned from him that he grew up in a family where he was just toughen up, you know, no feelings. And he realized how critical it was to have the permission to feel. And so that's why I called my book that, which was not like popular. People were like, oh, that sounds too fluffy. And I'm like, you know what? If we don't give ourselves and everyone we care about, and even the people we don't care about, the permission to be their true, full feeling selves, we're not going to go anywhere in our society. So I believe that's the starting point. When the adults who are raising and teaching kids are non judgmental, they're exceptional listeners, and they show empathy and compassion on a regular basis, that creates the context for kids and other people to have the permission to feel. Mark, you just mentioned you're speaking, and anybody who follows you on social media knows you are on the road all the time talking with educators and all sorts of folks about the importance of emotional intelligence. And I want to ask you about the fact that you are doing this at a particularly interesting time, because on one hand, the evidence for what's been called emotional intelligence, and on a related note, social and emotional learning, that evidence is increasingly robust. And yet, on the other hand, social emotional learning has become something of a lightning rod in the culture wars that, of course, reach our schools. And I'm curious, why do you think that is? And what might you say to parents or teachers who might be skeptical of emotional intelligence for all sorts of reasons? Yeah, I mean, it's unfortunate that I think some people misunderstand these concepts. The way I like to think about it is that we're trying to teach children real skills so they can navigate their lives 
and achieve their dreams. That's what it did for me. This is not a religion. It's not indoctrination. As a matter of fact, what's so important to the work that we do in particular is that children, for example, learn emotion management strategies that work best for them, given who they are, given their personalities, given their culture. We're not trying to ever tell someone how to feel or tell someone what to do with their feelings. What we want to do is give children and the adults who are raising and teaching them a lot of knowledge about emotions, a lot of skills for dealing with their feelings, and then let them be free to use that. You know, I'm very lucky, to be honest. You know, when I present this work, I rarely get any pushback. And I think it's because I try to be really clear about what this is and what it isn't. You've recently posted that you've got a new book coming out. It's entitled Dealing with Feeling. So what can you tell us about that project? I can tell you that I'm trying to deal with my feelings while writing that book. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I'm not kidding. I'm actually journaling. I don't know what I'm going to do with this journal, but I'm journaling as I'm writing because there's days where I'm like, today, I'm sitting there and I'm like, I don't feel like writing today. (laughs) And I'm like, will you give yourself permission to be free? It's your birthday. And then I'm like, yeah, but that's an excuse. I was going through all this stuff in my head. And so um, permission to feel was kind of my baby. You know, it was my life's work up until, you know, I was 50 or so. And dealing with feeling is really what I learned. People would write me these letters. They'd say, Mark, thank you for giving me permission to feel. It's been so helpful. But now how do I deal with all these freaking feelings? (laughs) And so this is like, it's not part two, but it is a deep dive into what does it mean to regulate? You know, and I talk about this in my first book, but not in as much detail. And I think the most important thing, going back to your question about the controversies around this, is that there's no correct way to regulate your feelings. Life is a journey of finding things that bring you contentment and things that help you deal with your stress. And what I want to do in this book is help people find the strategies that work best for them so they can have the life that they want to have. So, Mark, uh, we are going to finish up uh, on your birthday by doing a quick lightning round. So I'm just going to ask you a couple of rapid fire questions, okay? All right, go for All it. All right, question number one. How are you feeling right now on your birthday? An odd mixture of contentment and who am I, which is not a feeling. <laughs> <laughs> what is the most unique or maybe the most surprising emotion that you and your colleagues have identified? I'll tell you the one I like the most that I want to experience more, which is mudita, which is a word in Sanskrit that describes a sympathetic joy. Can you give us an example of when you might feel such a thing? Yeah. So like on a day like today, when I'm like, who am I? I'll take a walk in the park and I'll see some kids playing and they'll be like laughing and having fun. And I'm going to like kind of vicariously enjoy their joy. And so it's like kind of living through someone else's joy in the moment. I love that. The emotion that comes up most often in your martial arts practice where you hold a fifth degree black belt. Oh, that's a good one because my brain goes right to the word focus, but that's not a feeling. So I would say the feeling is exhilaration when I flip someone. (laughs) (laughs) And lastly, how can people find out more about the work you're doing? I think the easiest way is to go to my personal website, which is just Mark Brackett, M-A-R-C-B-R-A-C-K-E-T-T dot com. And you can follow me on socials and learn more about permission to feel and different things that we do in the app. Always like to stay in touch with people who are interested in emotions and emotional intelligence. Mark, before we let you go, just one last question, please. What's one thing that parents and educators can do today to make tomorrow a more promising place for every learner? I'm going to stick with they can give themselves permission to feel. And so they can be an Uncle Marvin to their students. And guess what? I think we can be our own Uncle Marvins, too. Thanks again to Mark Brackett, the founding director of the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence, a professor at the Child Study Center at Yale University, and an Uncle Marvin for teachers and students across the country. Keep an eye out for his next book, Dealing with Feeling. Remaking Tomorrow is powered by Remake Learning. Learn more at remakelearning.org.